Hey, thanks for clicking play on another episode of Remarkable Regional Business. I am Caleb Maxwell, and my guest today is Russell De Groot. Russell runs and owns De Groot Roof Painting. He has scaled that business from a sole operator to a team of 15 working across Victoria, Tasmania, southern New South Wales, and absolutely dominating in the commercial and uh, residential roof painting industry. He talks a lot about systemization, processes, and mentorship and team management, uh, all of which are key uh, elements of enabling the scaling of that type of business to where it is now, which is enabling him to go on a three-month trip with his family while the business still operates uh, largely without him. So no matter what type of business you run, whether it's a trade business or otherwise, I know you're going to get heaps of value out of this. Let's take it away. Russ, thank you so much for jumping into the studio with me. This is going to be so much fun. Pleasure, mate. Thanks for having me. Um, I want to start uh, by just digging into what is De Groot Roof Painting. So paint a picture of the uh, what the what the business does, yep. uh, what area it serves, um, how many people are in the business. Paint, tell, yep. tell us what, what is De Groot Roof Painting. De Groot Roof Painting. So obviously it – you listen to the name of it. It's obviously pretty self-explanatory, yes. um, even though that's changed a little bit over the last few months. Mm. Um, but traditionally, we've done roof painting, repainting of tile roofs, colour bond roofs, and old iron roofs, mm. um, and some re- like some restoration type work. Um, so yeah, we've been operating for about fourteen years. Started in Tassie, now in Victoria. Um, but yeah, we really our backbone, I suppose, is yeah, re resurfacing, recoding um, roofs that need some some maintenance done uh, on them. Yeah, awesome. So, how many uh, or what's this area that you kind of service? Like you said, you move from Tassie. Do you still service Tassie? Is yep. it where, where are you? Where are you? What roofs are you painting? Yeah, so we're statewide in Tassie. We have been for about eight years now, cool. um, and then we moved. Well, I moved to Bendigo with my wife um, for her uni back in twenty seventeen. Um, started doing some roofs in Bendigo. And then probably over the next couple of years, um, went to Ballarat, Shepparton, and, and pretty much service now all of Victoria and a little bit into sort of southern New South Wales. Wow. Um, we didn't used to do much in Melbourne, but commercially we've sort of we've started to do a bit more diversified a little bit more as well, and we're sort of doing waterproofing on commercial type sky rises and buildings and, and all that oh. sort of stuff in Melbourne. So we're pretty much statewide Victoria, Tassie, um, with with most of our services. Yeah. So I'm going to be pretending that I don't know too much about the roof painting throughout this conversation to, yep. just to pull out all the interesting parts. But in reality, we've known each other for, I don't know, a couple of years? Yeah, yep. Two uh, couple of years. Yeah, and we've done a bit of work with you. So I've become a lot more aware of the the ins and outs and intricacies and um, interesting parts of roof painting. But for someone who has no idea – can uh, why can you really specialize into roof painting and how different is it to just painting a house? Good question. Um, and this is probably why I oh, back in um, geez, be fourteen years ago, so whatever year that was, um, <laughs> yes. started doing it and specializing in it. There was no one really in Tassie that was specializing in it. Um, mm-hmm. There was a couple of guys that sort of did it, but they did other painting as well. And I liked the work myself. But mm-hmm. the big thing was it was always difficult painters don't always like heights, you know, same as most tradies, like you expect a tradie just to, to do everything, but they don't. Yes. In, partic- in particular, um, yeah, painters, um, they like doing stuff with their, their feet on the floor. Yep. Um, and I was always comfortable doing that. Yep. Um, I remember I think I probably got my um, – my competency at height um, when I was little, used to clean the gutters of mum and dad's house. Cool. Obviously no safety, nothing like that. I remember, you know, when it would rain, I'd slip down towards the gutter, catch myself. Ooh. Like it was pretty, yeah, <laughs> pretty, um, I wouldn't do it now. Um, but yeah, you sort of, I, I just liked doing it. It was um, something that I suppose a lot of other people didn't do. So when I was an apprentice, I was like, well, I'll get up there and do it. I, I enjoy it. Cool. Um, and then it just sort of stemmed from that. And 
finished my apprenticeship and and thought, well, I actually like doing it um, because there's not many other people do it. it was, mm. You know, I felt like there's a bit better money in it as mm. well, um, and I could do it. I could do it quite well. And you're outside, and you you know you're not inside smelling paint fumes and all that sort of stuff, yeah. which a lot of painters deal with. Yeah. So I just sort of went down that track and. Um, yeah, that's that's I suppose why um, how I I started doing it. I love that. How so? You, you started off um, apprentice painter, specialized, and then specialized in roof painting. Um, how did you start building a business that was bigger than just you? Um, so I did my apprenticeship for dad. So dad's third generation painter. I'm fourth generation painter. So. I actually started. Um, well, I started my apprenticeship when I was twenty, so a little bit later than a lot of a lot of people. Um, but yeah, it got to a point where um, it's not so much that Dad and I clashed or anything like that. It was more I've always been someone that's sort of driven to um, do it my way a little bit, um, and Dad's very old fashioned, very set in his ways away, yeah. and that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But I just got to a point. I'm like, okay, well, you know, I think I can do do this myself. Um, I still did a bit of work for Dad in the first sort of 12, 24 months in that transition period to a point where I got enough and generated enough leads and that sort of stuff mm. myself. And then and then sort of tackled um, tackled doing it myself. Um, but yeah, when I went out on my own, um, I was just doing it myself. And I remember one of my old housemates. Um, he used to stir me up all the time because, you know, if there was a cloud in the sky, he would stir me up, reckon I wouldn't work because, I'd, you know, <laughs> I might do a couple of roofs a week and I'd be happy with that. You know, when you're <laughs> early 20s, you just sort of do enough to get through and whatever and that was yeah. – and the rest was just fun, fishing, diving, whatever. Yes. But, yeah, just got <clears> – <throat> I think the big thing that kicked me really into gear was when I was playing footy, I think I was 23 or 24, I hurt my foot. I had a semi-serious stress fracture in my foot. Wow. And it sort of made me realise, I total, all up I had about 40 weeks in a non-weight-bearing cast or moonbird or whatever. Wow. And I got to that point um, and I sort of thought to myself, well, I, I'm not going to be able to do this forever. Mm. Um, I enjoyed doing the work, but I, I couldn't do it forever. So just ha- um, had a chat with a, a mate at the footy club and, and he was sort of in roofing but had enough of it. And I said, well, come and come and give this a go. And it sort of stemmed from there. And wow. I, th- I reckon probably the first six or seven in staff or, or subcontractors um, that we used to have back then um, were, were pretty much mates um, yep. through footy or cricket or, or whatever. Yep. Um, but, yeah, that's really where it, where it started. I think it was sort of I was almost forced into it and then yeah. got to a point where like, hey, I, you know, I can generate enough work to keep these guys busy and make enough money for myself and, and still do a couple of roofs here and there, but I didn't really have to be on the tools every day and obviously with my foot not getting any better over a couple of years, that's really what – um, what made me continue down that path. Mm. And so, you know, going from having a few subbies on, what does the team look like now? Completely different. <laughs> we went through huge changes about two years ago. Mm. Um, there was just, we went through COVID. There was just, we had so much work on. We had subcontractors back then. We had a couple of, or well, two or three um, other office staff that generally did the the quoting and sort of general general runnings of things, um, but yeah, completely different now. Where <clears throat> everyone's employees, we've got um, guys with different skills and attributes. We've got management levels in place now, um, and a lot of that stemmed from I suppose what happened a couple of years ago with some staff that um, I suppose started taking advantage of their position, mm. which I don't like to dwell on, but it happened. Um, so yeah, we're we're a team of we're sort of fluctuating. Coming into winter now, we sort of um, we sort of bring it back a little bit. So I think yep. we're sort of twelve to fourteen at the moment. Yep. Um, generally, when we when we get up and going, um, we're sort of you know higher teens um, yeah, right. as a team. Wow. Yeah. And <coughs> that scale of team, like you cover a fair amount of area, right? Yeah. So how does that work from? Um, team disbursement, like do you have an uh, office? Where do, how do you operate? Yeah, like so um, about oh, about 12 months ago we started working out of our – I bought a block of land um, for the business um, about or two, back in 2019. Didn't use it for the first few years but got to a point when we changed our model that we had to have somewhere that we could base ourselves. Um, and traditionally our sales team and, and office staff have worked from home, which, mm. which worked really well through COVID. Mm. Um, but then, yeah, we started operating out of there. Um, it it's definitely has its challenges when we're our staff at Bendigo based in Victoria and we're sending them 
all around the place. To give you an example, last week we were in Meetung Lakes Entrance. Wow. And the guys were there for there for sort of a week and a half. Wow. Um, and then this week we've got a crew in Melbourne and then another crew in Albury. Um, wow. So there's a lot of travel for the guys. Um, it's a little bit it, – it's one definitely one of our challenges um, where we try and compensate that you know, with the guys traveling and all that sort of stuff. But, you know, they've got families at home and, and all the rest of it as well. So we understand things can get mm. tiring and, and burn them out a little bit. So mm. we're just, we're, we're continually trying to work on that to sort of minimize that the best we can. But we don't want to go back to a model where we're winning work in other areas and then contracting it out when we don't have that control. Um, because yeah. that was a big thing that did did hurt us last time. Well, that's that's something that you've got now, and maybe through that experience of of exper- you know, the experience of it not going well with the contracting it out, you you control a lot of the process, and it's a very solid, really repeatable process that's built around achieving the outcome mm. in the best case scenario, uh, and serving the customer really well right so yeah. how i'm interested in how you've really i want to say like systemized corporatized a little bit of the the business so that it is its own entity and it's got reliability repeatability mm. from a, a smaller operation that yeah. you know you're kind of just you know um trying to touch every area yeah i think um it's a good question because and it's a lot of small business owners um, may or may not put time into it. I've got a lot of friends that are in, in the trade um, sector and they and they probably don't um, mm-hmm. put a, a lot of time. But I remember one, it was probably about four years ago, maybe a bit longer now, um, where I focused about six months of my time trying to systemize what we do. And then it's not long after I started with my business coach when I really started to delve deep into that and, and really understanding like, you know, us as tradies, um, when you're trying to actually write it down on paper with what you do with every single step of a job and every like this, the detail is just incredible. You don't actually realise on ha- realise how much you're actually you actually do in your day. Yeah, a lot of it sec- comes second nature because you've done it. You know, you've done your apprenticeship and you sort of just know how to do it. Like it could be something like changing a light. So. Most people can just walk in and change the light glow, but okay, how do you do that? You've got to think about safety. You've got to think about um, what type of light globe. You've got to think about, you know, um, the power side of things, um, you know, all those sort of other factors. And there's so many layers to it when when you're actually trying to write that into a procedure for one of your next staff members to do and carry out, it, it gets super in-depth, like it really does. So I think I've always had a big focus on that, like initially – when I first started seeing a business coach back in, um, I think it was 2017, um, a lot of it, I read a book called E-Myth Revisited, yeah. um, which is just all systemized, talks about a lady in a pie shop and, and whatever and, and how systemized things have got to be. So I think from that initial stage, um, it really, we sort of had that franchise mentality. Yeah. But you know, it's not 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 that we want to franchise our business, but it's more like okay, how do you how do you create a business to then have everyone run it and operate it day to day without you being in control of absolutely everything? Because it's so difficult, I think, as a business owner to let go at times, and you can really get caught up with the little things that aren't as you just don't need to be um, involved with. Yeah, they're um, not a high value use of your time. Yeah, it's. And it's like, I mean, what is systemizing the the business enabled you to do? Well, it's, it's enabled me to, I suppose, um, have some really good. It's, it's probably it's a good communication platform for our staff. So you know, each different role that's that's you call it call it management. So off the tools, um, people they can they can go in and and see what their expectations are and how to do each process. Like we're always refining it and trying to improve it. So. In the last six months, I'm, I've really honed in with our with our team, with our management team, to um, put their roles into video content and um, like how you know manuals and write as well. So you've got a, nice. a, a digital form and you've also got a, a video content form where it's just literally you're talking through what you're doing. So then if we do get someone else on in sales, well, then they can jump in and see that, which we're, it's a good example now where we've got um, a project manager on um, who's recently started our commercial stuff slowing down. Now he's jumping in to start doing some residential general painting quoting and some roofing 
quoting. Cool. He can jump in and, and lean on the way Amanda in the office likes to do it. So then um, so then he's satisfying the way she wants it to, to happen and, and making sure that it's systemized so, it, so that at the end of the day the customer's getting the same experience because – if you're not doing that and customers are getting different experience, that's where it can just fluctuate so much. And then, you know, at the end of the day, we know how to give the customer a good service, but if personalities come into it and then they then start differing on how they handle things and, and whatever, that's when the customer can start, you know, um, I suppose not getting that service that we want them to have. And that's important because uh, a lot of leads would come in through referrals, right? And, yep. and, if you you can't build on and scale uh, that side of your marketing, leveraging the customer base that you have served, if they're all over the shop and some mm. of them love you because they were dealing with Bob and some yeah. of them would really hate the brand because they dealt with Jim and Jim's no yeah. longer here. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think it's um, testing and measuring is always a big one. Um, so like we we've got so many dashboards and reports in the back end. Like we've probably gone overboard to some extent in the past, but we've yep. really refined them a lot more now. So it's like you know, each each man, um, person in management's got their own dashboard now, or working towards that, so then they can jump in at any stage and know if they're hitting their KPIs and their targets with what they've got to do. And it's not not based around it's not based around like dollars. It's based around conversion. It's based around client satisfaction surveys and things like that as well. So cool. there's. There's a lot of again. There's a lot of different different levels uh, to it, um, but it's just it's all it's all really important. It sounds like, uh, and I know you have gotten to a quite a level of complexity where you've got your finger on the pulse in multiple areas of your business, and you're able to drive, and you're sitting in the driver's seat, going, "Where do I want to steer this thing? Where are mm. the opportunities?" How, people don't just fall into that um, mm. mode of operation. How did you get from operations man to smart strategic business leader? Um, I've always had, I've always, I've always got this burning um, ambition to to do things better and like how can we improve? Like I always ask myself. So if a, if a situation happens in our business. It could be anything. It could be like um, someone spilled a bucket of paint. Like as simple as that. A lot of people, you know, and say to one of the technicians on site, a lot of people will probably look at that and, and um, you know, have a crack at that technician and say, what are you doing? You know, you bloody idiot, you know, whatever. But I always like to think, okay, has that person had enough training in that? Have we actually shown him how to carry a bucket of paint with a lid off it or he shouldn't be carrying that bucket of paint with a lid off it. Like there's yep. so many different levels to it and, yeah. and I think – always always try and you know tell our team there's always two levels when you when you've got something like that happening um they either they either haven't had enough training or they haven't been managed well enough yep. and if we can sit there as as a, as a management group and say well we've ticked those boxes absolutely everything like it's it's probably a personality thing or it's someone you know it's this they're not cut out for the job yeah effectively but then you're able to look at it. I love that point of view of not just going, oh, you know, staff, they're the worst, you know, you can't, they are so unruly and they're all ma always <coughs> making mistakes. There's always uh, a level of uh, ownership and responsibility you have to take as a business leader and manager yep. to go, was this a process problem? Mm. Was it a system problem? Mm. Or was it a person problem? Yeah. Because there's always both. Absolutely. But if you ignore the fact that you have control over uh, and responsibility to control a system and uh, an education piece and a training piece for mm. your staff, um, if you treat it that like it's not there, then that's a massive growth limiter, right? Yeah. Because you, you're not – you're um, at the whim of um, good people who just figure it out and mm. learn how to do it themselves mm. and people – who who aren't built like that? Yeah, and will never learn how to do it themselves. Yeah, yeah. And look, to be honest, I think during COVID with our business, like I was back in Tassie at that point, so I've, I've since moved back to um back to Bendigo over twelve months ago. But during COVID, not being able to travel here, that's where a lot of that started creeping in. Where I was trusting um, our management at that point and our lead technician on site to to train our next lot of lot of guys. And it was sort of get it got to a point where we didn't know unless the client reached out to us, and then there was a lot of you know covering up and that sort of stuff. But like we've got to we've got to really um, 
we've got to know what's going on in the business at all times. And I think it's, you know, that's definitely one thing I've learned. We've got to, you've got to be able to test and measure it. Um, but you've also got to make sure that you're giving your staff everything they need to do the job mm. because if they don't know, they don't know. Yeah. You know, it's as simple as that. Yeah, totally. Um, I want to dig into some unique elements of DeGroote roof painting as a, as a roof painting company, as a painting company. What sets you apart from uh, other operators or other businesses that are doing it? Do you do things differently at all? I think um, our quoting system, the way we the way we quote's always been very streamlined. Um, so I, I created a, a spreadsheet years ago, again, after I started seeing my business coach. I got to a point where, uh, actually no, it was before that, um, I got to a point where I was driving to a job and I'd literally sit out the front of the job, I'd look at a roof and say, okay, that's going to be that much paint, that's going to take this amount of time, okay, it's going to cost that much. I got to a point I'm like, well, why am I wasting my time doing that, wasting fuel, all that sort of stuff, where like, surely there's another way. <clears throat> so then I came across a company called Nearmap, um, which is aerial imagery. Um, I know there's heaps, like it's, when I first started using it, that was that would have been 2015, I reckon. Yeah. Not not one not many people really knew about it, mm. but now it just seems like so many other businesses use it for so many different things. Mm. It's also got a hell of a lot more expensive, but yeah. <laughs> but to be able to, <clears throat> I suppose, quote our jobs from near map, also using Street View and things like that as well, and some other and pretend, and and at times client images that they send through to us, it allows us to get the quote out really quickly. Mm. But it also, I suppose, it. Clients don't always want traders coming in their backyard before they're engaged to do a job. So there's always there's always that sort of trust issue. So we can fully do it, provide a fully written quote, um, cross all the i oh, sorry cross the t's and dot the i's with everything um, without actually going on site and and know what to expect when we get on site. It's pretty know, cool. Obviously, sometimes you're going to need to go on site to inspect a couple of things or whatever. But with roof with a roof painting side of it, roof restoration, it's generally pretty. Pretty standard standard procedure. Yeah. It might be just deter, uh, determining, okay, does it need a re-bed? Does it need a re-point if it's a tile roof? Or does it need a re-screw or a couple of sheets replaced if it's an iron roof? But we can provide pricing at the initial stages so the client knows, okay, worst case, it's going to cost me this. When we get on site, we then evaluate it um, and then and then we can work back from that and say, okay, well, it's not going to, we don't need to do this, this and this. Well, we, we've just saved you a couple of grand from that point of view because uh, it didn't need doing it. Um, so I think that's definitely that's one. Pretty cool. That's definitely one thing. Um, we've invested a lot of money and time into safety, which yeah, is another. Tell me one. about the edge protection. <clears throat> yeah. So um, yeah, up until two years ago, we we'll, were we'll basically staying in the grey area. Call it um, from a safety point of view. You know, you can still use harnesses and, and anchor points and things like that in, in certain scenarios, but. Victoria is a much more um, strict state on height safety. So pretty much we got to a point, sat down with WorkSafe. We had a couple of um, visits from them with our contractors on site. So, so I sat down with them at a point and, and pretty much the, the the guidelines to us was you have to put up edge protection um, if you can and then you work through a hierarchy, it's called a hierarchy of control and then you know the next measures might be harness and, and whatever. So we just made a decision a couple of years ago um, right, we're not doing any of this grey area stuff anymore. We're just going to fully go in. So we spent a lot of money on edge protection, setting, you know, bought trucks and and set all that stuff up within our business. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, the biggest thing that used to keep me awake at night was not knowing. Number one, the guys who were doing the job have they been trained properly in in safety? Obviously, in particular during that COVID time when I couldn't get up here. And I think the big yeah the biggest thing was if if someone if someone came off a roof and seriously injured themselves, which has happened in our business, but not not due to um, lack of um, not, not due to lack of safety, probably more lack of lack of care from the the worker. Um, if someone came off and seriously injured themselves or died, mm -hmm. obviously I'm liable, but it was more that I feel like I, I sort of took that personally. I yeah. always think that personally. So up until a couple of years ago and then and since then it's always it, we've, our safety conscious has been always at the forefront. Um, it was always a conversation, well, you bring safety into your into, with the edge of protection into your business, well, it's going to cost your customer an extra twelve to 1500 bucks. No one's going to buy your service. But then it comes back to with that, um, educating our, our client base to, to make sure that they're aware, well, it's actually mandatory in its law that it goes up. 
So the, all of that sort of stuff came into it as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a. <clears throat> it was full on at the start, but I'm so glad we did it. Yeah, and I mean, for a new customer who hasn't had any exposure to roof painting, they're not going to know any different. No, like you tell them it's going to cost them ten grand, and they're like, "Well, I didn't know what it was going to cost." So. Yeah. Fine. Yeah, yeah. You know? it's, it's just always difficult. It's always there's always going to be cowboys out there that go this roll in and they don't have any safety gear or they've got a harness or whatever and they yeah. they wear it but they don't actually they're not even tied into anything. Yeah, I see it driving around still. So yes. there's always going to be that element. But like hopefully, as we're educating you know the general um, population with what we do and safety and all that sort of thing. Hopefully, and I think people are getting smarter with this stuff now because it's. You know, you, you see all the numbers of of height safety injuries and deaths in you know in Victoria alone. Like it's it's mind boggling how many people get injured mm. from working unsafe. Mm. Um, so I think um, yeah, the the general population is getting a little bit more um, aware of the safety concerns. So I think when they see the way that we the way that we do things, I think that really. I suppose, put some confidence in them that, okay, we're not just going to get the job done well. We're also going to get it safely and I was going to die in my backyard effectively. Yeah, yeah. and that kind of matters <coughs> to a lot of people, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, I want to ask about uh, some successes or things that you can look back on over the years and, and uh, make you feel really proud of achieving. Like what are some achievements that you can say, you know, hand on my heart, we tried something, it worked. How cool is that? I think the tra- the biggest one was the transition from subcontractors to a full employee model. Um, it's a pretty big change. Our main guys back then were subbies and they, they liked the subby model because they were good at the job. Um, they would basically earn as much as they wanted to to a point because yep. they would work seven days. Yeah. But when we transitioned to employee model, we obviously had the <clears> – <throat> There's um there's parameters in there. You can't just you can't have your employees working seventy hours a week because there's obviously no H and issue with that. Um, you know, driving after hours and all the, all these other factors come into it. So it was very, I suppose, nerve wracking at that point because knowing that okay, we're probably going to lose a couple. Um, and we did. Like we we lost a really great guy in Tassie. Um, because of that. Um, and don't hold him. Um, don't hold that against him because he he liked that model and it worked well and he's doing great things for himself now. But um, that was very that was definitely one of those things where really unsure with how things were going to go and and all that sort of stuff. But I think it's funny that the longer I've been in business, the more you realise you know one door shuts, another one opens, and it it so often happens when we might have one of our staff that just isn't fitting into our culture and we've got to move them on um, and we've done it we've done it you know it happens every every few months really when it, when someone gets to that point um, and then that happens and all of a sudden someone just rocks up almost out of the blue and they've yeah. got the qualifications you need wow um, and you know you put them on and they're a better cultural fit you wow. know? but we start and that, another thing I know we're digressing here but we used to hire on skills and you know abilities and stuff, but yep. now it's we try and hire on um, on the the personality and right. you know the work ethic and the and their attitude yeah. is, is the big thing. Yeah, um, because that, yeah, one bad one bag e- egg spoils the rest. I realized I didn't ask how many roofs do you paint? Like, what kind of scale of uh, operation are we talking about here? About how many clients you service in a month, yep. for example? So. Yeah, we've, we've, as I mentioned before, we've sort of changed our tact a little bit. So the last um, the last probably eight, nine months, we've sort of started targeting a little bit more commercial stuff. So commercial jobs, bigger jobs, they take longer. But look, traditionally, we've been between three to 400 a year. Um, traditionally, I think we got up as high as 550, something like that in, in COVID. But again, Installing edge protection slows the process down as well. Yep. Um, so on a north standard residential, we might have been in and out in a day wow. um, back then. Mm. Now it's you know it's half a day to set up edge protection, do the work, and then you know you're back on the second day um, and and sometimes third day with a sort of standard size standard size job. So it's definitely slowed it down a bit. But also COVID times were just nuts. Like yeah, just the phones were just off the hook all the time. We had, had spent no money on marketing. It was just yeah, unbelievable. Your and your value proposition, <laughs> or your your <laughs> phrase, your your statement, uh, brand statement is protecting the roof over your head. Yeah, and everybody was sitting 
at home with their roof over their head yep. going, oh, I've got a bit of money. What am I going to do? Yep. I'm, I'm in my house. I see my house all the time. Yeah. 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 I've driven yeah. a fair, a bit of, a fair yeah. amount of business. Yeah. Like we had over 100 roofs in front of us all the time just in Victoria and we probably had 40 to 50 in front of us in Tassie all the time. Like it was just – Wow. Yeah. It just got to a point where it was like it was too much um, and I kept on trying to tell our guys, you know, just um, – Make sure you focus on quality, you know, all that sort, all that yeah. sort of normal stuff. But you know, it's still like, and I think at during that time as well, clients expected things were going to take ages. Like you just hear the story of like no one could get a builder or any trade for twelve months. Like it was just nuts. So like you know, if we got there in six months' time, we've, and that that's okay. Whoa. Yeah, that's which wild. yeah, and our like our we always like to keep it around three months in front of us. Is, is sort yep. of we're pretty comfortable with that. Yeah. Um, but again, commercial stuff sort of changed out a little bit for us now again. Um, wow. Well, we'll dig into that kind of and and what that kind of opportunity and how it's different and stuff. But just to lay out the process for someone who has no idea about uh, roof painting, yep. is it literally you just you get up there, you spray the paint on? What? <laughs> no, no. So it's a little bit more, yeah, a little bit more involved, but. Um, let's talk about a, an iron roof or color bond roof. Okay. Um, their, their processes are pretty similar. So edge protection gets installed first, obviously safety safety first. And for those who have no idea what that is, it's like uh, guardrails around the roof, right? People like to think of it as scaffold effectively. Yeah. So it stops anyone physically being able to fall over the edge of the gutter unless yep. you climb over it, yep. which no one's going to do, <laughs> you'd hope. Um, so, yeah, we install that. Um we replacement of nails and screws, cleaning gutters, um, you know, all the other stuff like the, the standard stuff, like checking down pipes, making sure water's going to flow away, any vi- you know, visual holes and cracks and things like that in the roof that might um, allow water ingress um, during the cleaning process. And then, um, yeah, pressure clean the roof, um, rinse it all down. We'll rinse the outside of the gutters and fascias and exterior of the building where it's sort of dirtied from our processes, you know, paths and driveways and things like that. Just the mess that we that we make. Um, and a bit more. And then generally if it's a faded colour bond, um, it'll be a two-coat system with Dulux Acrotex, 15-year uh, warranty on that. And then if it's an older iron roof, there'll be a metal primer or some other type of primer that would use, so like an old galvanised roof. Um, there'd be, yeah, there's a few different primers, um, different options we've got there depending on the substrate or the, the how poorly it was painted or condition it's in. Yep. And then a couple of coats of the Acrotex as well. Um, and then again, product sort of 15 year warranty. Um, we also offer heat reflective um, product as well, which lowers the, um, I suppose, heat getting absorbed into the building, which then meant to lower um, cooling costs and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, so increases the efficiency <coughs> of the home. Yes. It's pretty yep. cool. Um, what, and I suppose from talking about a, a, a rusted old roof. Yep. Um, the part of your value proposition is being able to, you know, for roof restoration, someone's got the choice of replacing the roof or yep. most of the time, right? They yep. could repaint it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what, what do you, what's the comparison there? Well, I didn't mention that in the process, but old iron roof, if it's got rust, we, we put a rust converter on it, which okay. will effectively slow the rust down. And then we um, effectively a, a ceiling over the top. So, you know, as soon as you cut um, oxygen off from rust, it'll slow it right down. Mm-hmm. Um, there's always a little bit, bit of oxygen getting through the product. It's a breathable product. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously it will will come back over time. Um, but there's also some other, some other products associated with that as well. But I think um, a lot of people look at the roof and they think, okay, it's got rust on it, it's no good, it's buggered all, we'll just leave it till it's it's knackered, but it's absolutely not the case. I reckon we'll do around about 40% of our roofs we do currently that have got rust on them. Okay. Um, very, very rarely, unless it's an application problem from the guys on site, um, have we had someone come back and the rust has bled through the top coats. Wow. Um, and we've been doing this for 14 years. Wow. And there's, there's one particular job in Bendigo, um, there's like a, it's a duplex place so it's like side by side brick wall in between identical yep. roofs yep. they're the same age rust I, I did that one with um with the the system we used to use back then not a bit of rust has come back through and that wow. was like that was i suppose one of the testing the testing ones wow how long uh, ago was that uh it was seven years ago seven years yeah 
That's pretty which good. Which is very good for us. Like, wow. And that, that's the thing. Like the, the products that they've got now and the, in particular the acrylic products for, for rust, um, you know, to limit rust and rust inhibitors and all that sort of stuff, they they're, they really are very good. Mm. What's the cost difference? Like if someone's looking at it and going, well, uh, I'm going to maybe have to replace this or yep. what's the alternative? So our average cost, um, and, and there's so many factors here, but look, yep. let's just say average yeah. is six to eight grand. Yep. Um, and that gives the client a um, a five to 15 year warranty depending on the substrate. Um, a re- roof replacement, um, I'm sure most people would be aware of how, how much um, – Color bond steel's gone up. I think it's gone up forty percent or Ooh. something just in the last um, three or four years. Wow! Um, so a standard roof replacement look, it can be up to when I say up to. There's obviously how long is a piece of string, but yes. on average, it's six to eight times the, the cost. Wow! Depending on it, there's so many other factors here too. Yeah. It's like we use edge protection, but if you're re-roofing a house, you may need to use scaffold or you may need to use something yeah. to get the sheets up to the roof, yeah. um, and depending on how high the building is and all that. There's all those, yeah. And that's where just the cost with that stuff just, you know, just increases quickly. Skyrocket it. So if you were to say sort of like six to eight grand for a, a roof um, restoration job versus, you know, 30 to 40 for a replacement, you'd be probably in, in around about the ballpark. Wow. So... Even if you repainted the roof a couple of times in like yeah. 20 years, yep. <laughs> you're still going to be ahead. Absolutely. And the other big thing, he, he most people are only in their home for seven years. So, yeah. you you know, it happens all the time. Someone buys a house, they get us in there, restore the, you know, we restore it. Um, and then the, st- the stats say that they're going to move out in seven years. So why would you spend 30 or 40 grand on a new roof when you're not going to be there for 30 or 40 years? You know, yeah. Yeah, and a lot of people. There's so many. There's so many things to it. But a lot of people like that older look. You know, old Victorian type of yeah. type of roofs. You know, like yes, they're dented and, and whatever, but they're the old traditional sheets and, and all the rest of it. A lot of people yeah. like that look. Yeah. Oh, it's pretty interesting to say I've got a 150, 60, you know, whatever yeah. hundred year old roof on there. Yeah, yeah. Which <laughs> which we do lots of lots of work like that yeah. when they're older than that. So yeah, that's amazing. Mm. Um. What are some of the challenges that you've experienced or gone through that have uh, you've pulled really good lessons out of and you're like, I wouldn't be here uh, if I didn't learn that? Um, the, uh, you, you learn a lot of lessons. Um, I'm just trying to think if there's anything in particular. Um, I, think, I think probably guys getting – Getting injured on you know on site um, where they're where they're not carrying out the safety that's required um, and obviously then installing the edge protection that, that that's a that's a that's a really big one for us mm. products um, oh products is a good one too actually yeah. so we used to use a, a standard exterior paint which was specified by the paint manufacturer I'm not okay. going to mention any names okay. um, <laughs> and we did that on faded color bond roofs for a number of years. And it was fine until we came to Victoria where the sun's a hell of a lot harsher. Wow, really? Um, and we only we only coated roofs up here for about two years until we switched to a full roofing membrane system because right. the company didn't supply that type of um, system at that stage. Right. It's still in this, It's still in the product specs, 10-year warranty, all that sort of stuff, but it just wasn't holding up. Um, wow. So moving across to the full membrane system and um, has definitely been something that um, – you know, at that stage, we probably went okay. What's the what's not the cheapest paint, but what's the what's the what's the yeah what's the best cost effective way to paint someone's roof? Yeah, um, and still give them give them a good warranty. Yeah, and that was a two coat system. It was an exterior product. It's easier to spray all that sort of stuff at that stage. Yeah, um, but then falling on our sword with that, you know, we've we've had to go and fix. A fair few jobs, or wow. we've been provided the product to go and fix the jobs. Wow. It's not an application issue; it's a product issue. Yeah. So definitely making sure you're using the best quality products has been, and we'll always do that. The best gear and equipment you can yep. buy. Um, you know, we've got good, reliable trucks. Yeah. All of that sort of stuff. Yeah. If you skimp on gear and equipment and material you're applying, you just is if it's always going to be that weakest link mm. in the, in the chain. 
Um, so we're always trying to make sure that we're sort of using the best stuff out there. Yeah, and you might save a buck or two in the short term, but if you're planning to be around yeah, in five, ten years, absolutely. then like, like your experience with those couple of years, yeah. uh, there's you pay, you will have paid for it or been paying for that yeah. choice later on, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We've we've had some gear that's been seriously mistreated in the past. It's still going today because it's top quality stuff. Wow. Spray guns, pressure washers. Yeah. That sort of stuff. So, you know, you, you buy the best and you, you know, you're going to get the best result. But, you know, some of these have been in circulation for eight years and they, they probably get serviced a bit more than some of the other ones, but yeah. they still work really well. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. Mm. Um, how about, I know as a, as a, a business grows, priorities and focuses um, move through into different stages. Have you ever kind of um, found yourself in the positioning yourself in the wrong spot in the business, or have you? How have you kind of managed your own uh, transition from on the tools to managing? And was there any learnings out of that process? Um. I know one thing off the top of my head. So the guys generally, on Amanda in particular, um, she doesn't like me jumping back in doing residential quotes because I'm not detailed enough. <laughs> um, so when right. I when I used to do it, I'd quote it, I'd know the conversation, you know, but then I've then built into our procedures to make sure that the guys are, okay, they're, they're taking notes and, and if Amanda's not here for a week, she goes on leave, someone else can then jump into her seat and know exactly where the job's at. Yeah, so right. definitely that's one job in the business that um, is not a strength of mine. Yeah. Um, so I sort of try and steer clear of that because yep. Amanda you know, gets into you when, um, <laughs> when she sees something, which is a good thing because yeah, she's holding great. me accountable, which, which I want from everyone. You know, yeah. Just because I'm the business owner, it doesn't mean that I've got any, any right to do things wrong or, yeah. or you know, differently the way we want it done. Mm. Um, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Elaborate on your question a bit. So in terms of you you obviously started in the business as uh, painting roofs. You know, you're on the tools. Uh, and you had to uh, transition yourself over a period of time, I don't know how long that was, to managing people, uh, hiring staff, um, doing business strategy, sales and marketing. You know, was there a point where you completely stepped out of getting on a roof or and put all of your focus into a, a different space, into the growing the business rather than working in the business. Yeah, I think when we're when our on-site guys have been solid in the past and we're our workflow's nice and steady, we're, you know, or, and all that's happening. That's when I sort of know that, um, and I've done a fair bit of it lately as well. When we've got the right management running the operations, our sales are going well. Um, that's when I know that okay. And, and it's not that I, it's not if things slow down a bit from a sales point of view that I jump in and start doing that job. It's more, okay, let's put a little bit more attention onto that and, and why are we dropping, why is our conversion dropping or why are our sales dropping? Is, you know, is a rate, it could be a marketing thing, we're not generating enough leads, all that sort of thing. But I think whenever I, um, I'm, I'm really big with the guys to do a default diary, which is like putting, okay. putting time aside each week to focus on things with developing their role or, or business development stuff. That's awesome. Um, and I've always, it's always been, well, traditionally it was, okay, 80% of the time you, you're working in your business and then 20, uh, yeah, 80% in your business, 20% on your business. I've always liked to run it the other way around as yep. much as I can. Yep. Not always the case. Like, for example, I'm about to jump back on the tools for the next three months before I go away for three months yep. to get some more training into our current guys, educate them, make sure that they're, um, you know, get to that next level. So when I am away, that then we don't need managers and, and whatever to jump in and make, and, you know, and do the work as such. That's cool though, because you, you've you got the opportunity to choose how that rolls. Like you're not stuck through necessity uh, really, but through yeah. strategic choice, yeah, enabling you to take how many months out of being on the ground in the business? Yeah, three to four. Three to four months. Yeah, there's not many business owners that can say I'm I'm going somewhere else for three or four months mm. and know that the operation is built to the machine is built to a point where it mm. can run. Yeah, with you remote or you not as uh, connected. Yeah, it take it. It's taken a long time. Like it's taken a lot of time. Where I'm thinking, everything I'm doing, 
just about within the business. I'm trying to do it. Um, you know, if there's an issue that happens, you try and fix it. So, okay, how how do we make sure that doesn't happen again? Yeah. And that that's my a lot of my job now is educating our managers um, in their in their particular roles. Okay, if something happens, don't just go and fix it. Yeah. You know, there's no point putting out lots of spot fires. Yeah. Actually, how do we how do we how do we fix it now? But then how do we make sure that we limit it in the future? And yeah. if you have that mentality for a long enough time, and you actually do implement that stuff, I think that's where you can get your business and everything running to a point where um, you're not getting calls. I reckon my phone rings less out of all the management group of everyone because they know, you know I suppose, what their role is, um, oh. how to how to find, how to answer questions. That Look, they lean on each other a lot, which is great, but they're not relying on me all the time. Like, yes, I, anyone can ring me up at any point. It could be one of the guys on site or someone in sales or someone in operations and I can answer the question, but – you know, the, the good thing is in the group we've got, they want to progress their, themselves and their own um, roles in the business where th- they think outside the box and, and, and how can we make sure this doesn't happen again. Yeah. Um, they don't just pick up the phone and ring me, which is which is good. And again, that's, that's, taken, that's taken a long time too. Yeah. Yeah. I want to pull on a thread that um, you mentioned a default diary. Just explain what that concept is for those who don't know. Yep. <clears throat> so you, default diary, either love it or you hate it. Um, I like it from a fact that you, you start out the week with a plan effectively. So like you might have, okay, your first hour, you might be doing email um, responses. The second two hours or like, you know, hour three and four, you might be doing, um, you might be doing uh, sales. And then back end of the day, you might be doing uh, business development or whatever it is. But it's really about, and you can get, some people get too detailed with it, but really what you want to do, you want to put in there and put time aside. And traditionally, when I first started seeing a business coach, it was about putting a couple of hours a week aside to work on your business. So the stuff that we'd made, we'd made about issues with our business or things that aren't working properly, whatever, you put two hours aside um, you know, of your week to, to focus on that. So it's really about, um, I suppose, when you're doing a task, concentrate on that task. And it's so easy to get distracted. Mm-hmm. You know, you can be running around doing a hundred things at once and not getting anything done. Yeah. You know, it's just, it, it, you see it all the time. So understand that, okay, when you're sitting down and you're generating quotes in our, for, in a sales office, don't pick the phone up for that period of time, generate the quotes, get them done properly and then return the calls. Yeah. That's great. It's really specifying the specific task that you're going to do for a time period and then protecting that. Yeah. As the thing that you are doing so that you're not splitting your focus elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah, that's really good. Um, And I like the point you made about people can get too detailed. If you go back to back on time blocks, and that's, well, we, I use a default diary system as well. Uh, but if you put in any given day, you're back to back minute to minute with uh, planned tasks. Yeah. You're setting yourself up to fail yep. because yep. things are going to move. Absolutely. And you're going to, if you're late on the first thing or you don't get to the finish what you wanted to in the first hour, it throws the entire day out and then yep. your week's gone. <laughs> yeah. And then you think like, and often people think I'm failing, so let's just not do it. Yeah. But it's like, if you try and simplify it, and I'm always encouraging putting, putting in like free time yep. in, in your, in your week. So you can catch up on certain things and whatever. Yeah. For example, you know, we expect that we're going to say, do generate 20 quotes a week, you know, one individual. We might get 30 one week, but then other tasks can't be done that week. Or then the next week we might get 10. So then there's more time to then catch up on the development stuff. Yep. So it's like it's got to be set set out to have the perfect week, but yep. know that you might get it once a year. Yep. Because it because it just doesn't life's yeah. not like that, and, yeah. and it's just it just doesn't happen like that. But when you you got to be trying to be strict as well, so then you're not halfway through an email, you're picking your phone up, you're then doing something, you know, you're doing all these multiple things at once. Um, when you're not actually getting anything done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to touch on the uh, strategic growth of the business. And you mentioned earlier commercial work. So uh, traditionally, you've, correct me if I'm wrong, you've done, uh, focused on residential. Yep. Um, you're pretty well dominating in the roof painting sector in Victoria and Tasmania for residential home roof painting. What, what uh, were your thought processes and strategic thinking about what's next for the business? Yeah. How are we going to grow this thing? Um, 
towards the back end of the last year, and it's always been such commercial, commercial and general painting, because that's the other sort of part that we, we're looking, we're growing. There's always been things that it's been like, okay, I'd love to sort of start tackling to, tackling that. And, and in regional Victoria, it's always been like chicken sheds. You know, there's so many chicken yes. sheds. They're like, you know, pretty low pitch. Like they'll just be the cream, the cream work. You yeah. Know, you get thousands of square metres. Like the amount of um, chicken sheds, companies like Hazeldean's, it's just mind boggling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was the initial, that was the initial one. Um, and then, um, and then the general painting as well. So there's sort of two, there's two, bits to that, I suppose. So the commercial stuff originally was the stuff um, probably July, August last year where I started feeling like, okay, our team's back on track now. We've got some good guys on, on the tools. Okay, let's look at getting someone into the business um, who sort of, you know, can do commercial sales for us and actually go on to see these people. Yep. So that's when we've got Michael. Michael on, um, 17 years experience in the paint game um, and, yeah, we're fortunate enough to, to get him on. And then we started sort of um, progressing with that um, down that that rabbit hole a little bit. We soon found out, well, chicken sheds. There's lots of chicken sheds, but they don't necessarily have enough money to recoat them because there's so much, there's so, so much involved. Much space, yeah. And then we came across a, a fantastic product, um, which is an American product called uh, Tops, which is a full waterproofing system. Um, this is like this is a game changer for us. Um, the the the, why, the reason the system's so good is traditionally we don't warrant against leaking. You know, we're going to restore sheets, you know, cosmetic, make the roof look nice. This product, you're literally sealing everything. So all cracks, holes, absolutely everything. And it's designed for flat commercial roofs, so big warehouses and all that sort of stuff. It's concrete roofs, bitumen roofs and iron roofs. Wow. Um, and that's where we've then got the opportunity to go to a commercial client that might have a 5,000 square metre factory to say, okay, you know, you're – your iron's um, deteriorating. Um, it's got some rust, whatever. But we don't just um, we don't just restore the sheets. We can also fully waterproof your, your building for fifteen years against any leaks whatsoever. Whoa! It's a hell of a lot more in depth. Um, the system and everything like that. It's a full solvent based versus water based with the other stuff. But it's um it's really and it's only it's I sort of feel like it's. It's not new, but it's, it hasn't really been marketed to a lot of commercial business and opportunities. So I think there's a really good opportunity for us there. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, so that's that's that one. Right. Any other questions on that before we move to general painting? <laughs> well, it's pretty. It's pretty mind-boggling. Like it's like you're wrapping almost uh, a building yep. so that it, it water's not going to get in there. Yep. And that that is a massive opportunity. Yeah. What, what are the challenges associated with that? Yeah, so it's like a, it's almost like a rubber product. So it's super like um, elast, elastic, yeah. elastic elasticity. Yeah. Oh, there's another name for it, but yeah, um, it stretches to like 800 times. I'm pretty sure that's right. Oh, um, 800 times it's dry film. Um, so when you've got a structure where it's it's obviously all structures, buildings move and, yeah. and whatever. So it can it can take up that. So you're effectively putting a rubber rubber on the um, on the roof, which is obviously yeah, you know, it's super thick and everything like that. The I suppose the issue is it's not an easy product to apply. Mm. It's it's really like we've had some good learning so far. Yeah. We've done concrete, bitumen and, and iron roofs. So we've had some really good learnings so far and, and we're working through that with the with the company for, you know, to, to make sure we keep getting the training and, and really skilling up. Wow. Um with it. But it's also, yeah, with it being solvent based, it's also adds another element you know, bigger spray guns, it's a thicker product, you're pumping it up higher, yeah. you know, pumping out of IBCs instead of just 20-litre paint drums um, and that sort of stuff and you, you're sort of putting a mesh into the system and it's a, it's it's really like a – it's a completely different different system altogether but yeah. it's along the lines of what we do, you know, yeah. protecting that roof over the head cool. um, in a different way. General painting is the is the sort of the, the next one and it's sort of been something that we've wanted to do for quite a while um, but – Again, it comes down to manpower and all the rest of it, but and and the, really the reason that we're we're doing it is because our client um, our client base generally they're not just getting their roof done; they're getting other things done, gutters, fascias, you know, and potentially their full house. Um, so yeah, we've branched into that now, oh. um, which has taken taken a while. Always been something we wanted to do, but it's just more resources and and why, that's why we haven't done it. Is that uh, spray guns to paintbrushes now, or yep. Yeah, a lot of it. Yeah, look, some of it can still be sprayed, but yeah, um, 
a lot more brush work, roller work, um, a lot more a different prep as well, like sanding um, as opposed yeah. to just pressure cleaning. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of different products as well um, to apply to exterior exterior and interior building um, versus the roof the roof coating stuff. So it's sort of like another yeah it's a, another whole branch business in itself. Really. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. And it it seems like that's a bit of a no-brainer now that having painted three to 500 uh, roofs a year for mm-hmm. the last however many years, that you will have quite the client base yeah. that you've worked with previously yeah. and have built quite a good brand. Yeah. Um, are you looking at your brand now as more of a – uh, and into the future as a group rather than just the group roof painting? I think we've got to, and that's the group group is something that we've been throwing around just because, you know, the group roof painting, we're going to miss opportunities for people saying, oh, they, they paint roofs um, and that's it. So I think, and even edge protection installations, another another part of our business that we can start doing for other, other businesses as well. Um, so that's another one we want to look at doing. So I think we'll, we'll need to do something at some point, um, but at the moment, you know, we're, we're generating so many opportunities through our current client um, database with previous jobs we've done mm-hmm. and also new ones that are coming in. So, you know, mentioning to them, okay, have you got any other painting work you'd like done? And then that's where we send someone out to then quote that work. Um, and it's just, it makes it so much better for the client as well because they don't need to deal with two tradies. They can just deal with us cool. um, and we can do the full system, um, which is, which is we only started in January, but it's working so much better. It's cool. it working really well. Our hey, conversion awesome. rates in, increased a little bit as well. Wow. Which is good in our average um, cost of sales increased too. Yeah. Naturally. Yeah. Huge. Um, by a, a considerable margin, you would think, especially on a larger project like getting the whole house done, for example, mm. that's a fair bit of work, right? Oh, heaps, yeah. Yeah. Well, like I said before, six to eight grand for a roof, it might be, it might be twelve to twenty for an exterior. Wow. Um, you know, full exterior, depending on you know whether board or brick or whatever. Um, but then you've got the interior, which might be ten to fifteen. Wow. Depending on yeah, there's and that's where it's like okay, we're doubling and tripling our average spend um, when we're doing jobs like, you know, jobs like that. But at the end of the day, the customer, they just want to deal with one trade company they trust. So if we can provide that, um, we're in a a situation now we can, we've got better management in place, why not, you know, that, and that's why, that's why we're doing it now. That's great. And that really gets back to what we were talking about before with systemization, being able to uh, um, productize your service to an extent where, you know, uh, to a uh, high Mar- low margin of error that every customer will get the same experience yep. because you've systemized it and you've got a process that mm-hmm. needs to be followed. Um, you can then operate on a high degree of trust mm-hmm. that, and and management to, to run that. Um, I want to round out this chat with uh, something I've noticed. I, we've done, I think you'll be episode... Um, eight or nine <laughs> when it, by the time it comes out. Um, the Nearly everyone I've spoken to so far has mentioned a mentor or a business coach. Uh, why, and I want to speak from your perspective, what, what part has a business coach played in the growth of your business? And, you know, there's plenty of businesses running that probably have never – uh, never engaged a coach yep. or a, a mentor like that. Well, what's been your experience? Um, well, initially when I um, when I, I suppose started seeking a business coach, um, I just knew I couldn't do it myself, and that's the big thing. Like I've got like Dad's been painting and decorating for fifty years or more, but it, within his business, he's not um, at the same hasn't got the same values as me and, and what I want to get out of a business. So I think I, I realised that um, pretty much, um, yeah, back in 2017 around, around then when we moved to Victoria. Um, that was probably the biggest the biggest one, but how they've helped. It's funny, like initially when I first started seeing a business coach, I was just would pester him like all the time. Like he'd make jokes, mate, you'd have your work done before I get home and have a cup of tea after our meeting. Like I was just so like in tune with it. Yeah. I just wanted to get like, and and it was like a big outlay for me then, like fifteen hundred yeah. bucks a month yeah. plus GST. So, yeah. um, 
you want to get that value. Um, and so I was just always like whenever I had a question, you know, okay, what, what can we do next? What can we implement next? What can we, you know, all that sort of stuff. So I was just like had this massive thirst for information and content. I was like listening to lots of books and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So I've sort of gone through that. Um, got the business to a good point where it was like, you know, had some good systems in place and I had a little break for a while and then got to a point, okay, we're going through a growth phase and then um, and then got rung an, another business coach up who was own the organisation that I started with. Wow. Um, which I wanted to have him as my f- initial one but didn't work out. Anyway, um, yeah, and then sort of jumped back on with him and, and the big thing I use him for now, it's, it's kind of shifted a bit. So... I ring him if there was, especially during the last couple of years, we've had so many changes. You know, I'd ring him and lean on him, and, and he'd always be an ear, and then he'd give me direct feedback. He's done. He works with so many different trade businesses, so he sort cool. of can leverage off that. So I use him for that. I don't use him like I don't ring him, have a set time with him each week or anything like that. It's just more when when things crop up, I mm-hmm. ring him and speak to him. Cool. But then now we're moving into him actually starting to coach our staff, cool. our, our, our key people. Nice. Um, there's obviously there's workshops and stuff we do and, and that sort of thing in Melbourne, but it's really like, okay, someone in, like in Michael in operations role, if he's having some difficulty with whatever it is, then he can lean on Keith and it's not always coming back through me, which again cool. – it allows my phone not to ring as much and soak up as, as much of my time for that. Yeah. <clears throat> but then when they get to a solution or, or whatever, then it gets raised with me. What do we think about this? You know, great, go for it. Or cool. help, maybe think about it like this, you know, because there might be some other other factors in there as well. I love that. Um, is your business coach and coaches being trade specific, industry specific? So my first one, Tim, um, he – he wasn't, so he'd come from sort of a more corporate background and then sort of got into business coaching. Keith, my current one, um, he's a typical tradie, um, straight shooter, tells it as it is. Um, yeah, that their organisation deals with pretty much just tradies, I'm pretty sure. Right. So specialising, they had trade businesses himself um, where – the point I'm at now, I don't want to ring him and, and sort of fluff around. It's like, okay, this is the issue, right? How are we going to fix it? Bang, yep. bang, bang. Yep. Or he'll call you out. You know, if I'm yep. if I'm doing things that I'm not sticking to our plans and goals and all that sort of stuff, he'll call you out on it, which is at my stage now of, of business is is what I need. I need someone to be that devil's advocate to say, hang on a sec, wh- why are you even, why are we looking at that when we've just been working on this or yep. you're going great with this area, like keep your focus, keep, yeah. keep your focused. Yeah. Yeah. There's not too many business owners that I know that operate uh, at a successful level that haven't got someone in their corner like that. Yeah. What would you say to someone considering doing – is a business coach worth it? Because I mean, my business coach is equally large spend, right? It's a it's an outlay at, at north of two grand a month. Yeah, it's a it's a decent investment. Yeah. Well, what would you say? <clears throat> so, the big one is like you know fifteen hundred bucks a year. It works out to be roughly um, twenty grand or something like that. Yeah. Yep. A year. Like when I first signed up, it was a lot of money, mm. and I said to myself, okay, I'm gonna. Whatever whatever it costs, I'm going to do it for 12 months and have a crack at it. You look back on that 12 months with, with what you learn and how much your business grows, and it doesn't happen straight away. It can take six months before you start actually seeing the fruit. You know, you plant a tree, t- you know, that saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it takes time. Yeah. But it's also about like training your mind how to think. It's mm-hmm. not just about them getting in. They don't come in and fix your business. Yeah. You know, it doesn't have you – know, it's it's how, you, how to think in business and all that sort of stuff. But it, it honestly is – when you when you're surrounding yourself by people working in your business that are getting paid and and whatever, or you know people it might be people at home or whatever, they they got that financial side of things where they 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 want something out of it. Mm. Whereas a business coach is someone outside looking in that's got a hell of a lot of experience, can see something from an overall perspective, and can say, well, hang on a sec, you know you haven't thought about this or whatever. So I think. If you're serious about business and you actually want to grow your business and you're not from a trade point of view and you're not a one-man band or you've got a couple of guys and you're happy with that, that's fine. But if you actually want to grow your business so then you can get out of your business or not be working directly in your business with the day-to-day stuff, business coach is absolutely worth every single do- every single dollar. Yeah. Um, I don't I don't I don't reckon there's many people that have done it without one, put it that way, or yeah. 
if they had if they've done it without one, they've probably listened to a lot of books and podcasts, and and they get their advice from that yep. and implement that. Yeah. Because they they keep you accountable too, which is the, which is the other big thing. It's easy to get lazy when you own a business. Things are going well, all right. I might just go fishing a couple of extra times or whatever, but they keep yeah. you accountable to things. Yeah. So true. Yeah. I'd echo all of that. Um, as we round this uh, discussion out. Um, what are some tips that you would give to maybe your younger self? Yeah. Um, things that you'd say to other business owners that you've learned along the way that have really kept you yep. um, going or or you've learned something that's been really valuable and you hold as a really high um, you know, piece of advice for business? I think it's um, don't be afraid to fail. And don't be afraid to to lose. Um, and when I say don't be afraid to fail, you know, there's a, there's a lot in that. But put trust in you know, recruit staff and and put trust in them for them to do their role. Mm. And sort of the hardest thing for me was to let go yeah. when I first when I got my first employee on in the office. Letting go of the quoting process was um, and the sales in the in the business was really difficult. Once I did it, a couple of months later, I was like, wow, that's why didn't I do that twelve months ago? Yes. So I think, yeah, yeah, really having having faith in your people. And look, if you get burnt, you're going to get burnt. Like yep. it, it absolutely happens. All you can do is learn from it, put some things in place to make sure that you know um, they're meeting the requirements that you that you that you need to have happen. You can test and measure. You can build reports and things within your business and all that sort of stuff, and get client feedback as well as a big one. But yeah, I think really putting faith in your in your staff yep. um, is a really big one and sort of trust that they're you know going to do the right thing be able to let go and yep. let them let them run with uh what and i see that you've put in some really good kpis for example and and guidelines to so that your staff know yeah. where the boundaries are what the expectations are yep. yeah 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 yeah, I think that's probably the main the main one. There's lots of others, but that that's probably the main one that comes to mind. <laughs> Good one. Thanks, Russ. Mate, I really appreciate you spending the time with me. It's been uh, wild getting into the details of your your business journey and what to group roof painting is and what it's uh, heading into. It's really exciting. Beautiful. Thanks for having me. Well, that's it for this episode. If you really enjoyed listening, why don't you drop a comment in the comments below? Uh, make sure you like the video and uh, subscribe to the channel so that you get updates on when all of the next ones come out. That really helps grow this little uh, community of uh, people that are diving into regional business and uh, celebrating and learning more from it. So really appreciate your support and I can't wait to see you in the next one. Thank you.